So that is how you. I'm good. Yeah. Thank, thank you for joining us. Um, so before before you know we we start about the story of my mom. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know, early life and things. First of all, thanks all of you for showing up. Uh, and also, I would also like to know a bit more about you. So I appreciate the time I got to mingle with you all uh, upstairs and get to know your whole startup ideas. Uh, some of you are in corporate, uh, planning to jump into startup industry. So uh, good luck to your employers as well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so a bit of background about myself. Um, uh, I've always had an interest in technology. Uh, even way before I started uh, my high school in uh, Ranawanta. Uh, and after that, I pursued my degree in information technology, especially in businesses. Uh, so in order to achieve that, I moved to Malaysia to pursue my degree. And while I was doing that, uh, I got exposed a lot to the startup industry, more than the corporate industry itself. Uh, so I do part, I do volunteer in startup right there. Uh, I went to at least 10 or a dozen of their talks and got to speak with the CTO of Grab, the head of Malaysia, the Lazada, and the people like that and the problems that they are facing and the solutions that they are coming up with, that well, I could say that the corporates might take a um, year to resolve that they are doing in a matter of weeks. And that really interested me and the way that they were using technology uh, to achieve these goals made me interested in pursuing the startup industry in the field of business more than technology itself. So right now I'm the CEO of my own media. My role is to basically achieve operational efficiency, uh, not just by the help of technology, uh, but when it comes to a whole business, it's not just the internal operations, you're talking about dealing with vendors, dealing with clients. So um, the whole journey of launching a business, learning from other startup founders, uh, and even before that, I got the amazing experience of working in a company right after uh, my final year of my degree was a startup accelerator. So what we did uh, was uh, I got to mentor a lot of startups in Malaysia, uh, working with the likes of, um, who, who can I name drop? Uh, again, the head of Lazada was one of our mentors, so I got to work alongside him. But let, let me stop you right there. Why, why startups? Right? Why start in specific? Because, because any, any you know, all these tests, uh, startups or any owner would jump, right? If you go into corporate, you would make ton more money than, you know, working in a startup, right? So uh, what, what made you interested in startups in specific? Because corporates are comfortable. Even in more of these, even in Malaysia, everywhere in the world, corporates are comfortable. Uh, they provide you with a day-to-day -day job which you will be doing the same thing day in and day out for months to come. At the end of the day, I believe if you have 10 years of experience uh, working in a corporate environment, you basically have one year of experience for 10 years doing the same thing. So what the startup does is turn that all around. Even if you're an employee at a startup, I can guarantee you what you're doing in the first two months of the company will be totally different from what you'll be doing in the next two months. Um, and as a startup founder, that works even faster. So that experience uh, of working in a startup company as well, the learning curve is way steeper. You might join a marketing position and just be introducing yourself to online marketing, but then next day you have the bots of Google Home Assistant coming out. Now you need to learn marketing on how to do that because you are ahead of the curve. Right. So, so, so after all this. Uh, Tell us a little bit about my bump, right? What, what is actually my bump, and uh, how how did you go there, right? How many of you have heard of ad tech before today? So we we have a few people, and then yeah. So we for those wouldn't know even if they're lying, right? So yeah. yeah. So for those that don't know, it's advertising, basically, uh, but with the help of technology. But what technology does for advertising is, uh, it's still the same philosophy of. Uh, marketing products, promotion, and getting into the psychology of the product and of the person, or of the consumers. But what technology does is take that to a whole new level. Uh, you're talking about much bigger scale with the help of technology, much bigger transparency with the help of technology. So what my mom does is, I'm sure you've seen uh, on-the-road advertising, uh, some cars have it in Maldives as well, cars with ads on it. So even in Malaysia, that's not something new. We've had taxi advertising, bus advertising, uh, for decades in Malaysia as well. But the problem that exists in that industry is 
you don't know if you put a wrap on a bus whether that bus was out of service for the whole month and did anybody even get to see the wrap. The same thing goes for taxis. You don't know whether the taxi was driver was driving around or was, was he just sitting around at the nearby uh, shop waiting for customers. So it's, that's, that's the only location the ad was running basically. So what my mom does is, number one, we wanted to increase the number of possible ad space on the road. So before uh, we actually go there, uh, how, how did you actually come up with the idea, right? Yeah. Because, because any, any good idea or any business has to come from a necessity, right? You have to have a problem, right? So where was your you know, pain point? How did you come? Why did you decide to build this ad tax car? Yeah. Uh, definitely. Uh, for us, the idea came from just sitting in traffic jams. And if you've been to Malaysia, you know the 30 second traffic jams and the honking that you get in Maldives is nothing compared to the traffic jams in Malaysia. You could be stuck there for hours and hours. And while you're stuck there, you're not doing anything other than looking at the cars in front of you and around you. So we saw that as an opportunity that, hey, these billboards that only exist maybe every few kilometers could be the billboard sitting in front of you while you're driving. So we wanted to use that, and at the same time, as a driver, uh, you hate traffic jams. What if you could be thinking that, hey, I'm, I'm earning a little bit of money while I'm stuck in traffic? So what we created a crowdsourced model where everybody who drives on the road, private car owners basically, could earn a little bit of income based on how long they're stuck in traffic and how long they're driving. So, and for the clients, you will know exactly uh, how far your plan is traveling at any given time and where exactly is your car traveling. So based on that information, the client knows exactly where the money that it's going to the So it's like, it's, it's, it's like uh, moving billboards, right? Exactly, yeah. It's on the road mobile billboards. And these are real people with real lives, basically endorsing for your brand while they're driving around. And so it's a win-win uh, for advertisers. They're not basically talking to a bus company or a taxi company anymore. They are touching real people's lives by getting them to endorse brands on their car. And, right, and, 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 and so you have a problem, right? You have, you have a solution as well. The next step is how, how do I get customers, right? For you, you have uh, two portions there, right? You have to get the drivers as well, as well as you have to get the advertiser on board as well, right? Yeah. So in order to go to the advertiser, you need to have uh, drivers, right? And in order to go to the drivers, you need to have a campaign, right? So yeah. how, how did you actually tackle this? Uh, there's a very interesting, uh, in the startup scene, we call it the chicken and egg, I mean, any industry, the chicken and egg problem. The clients want drivers, drivers want clients. Uh, nobody wants to come on board before we have the other. But we found out that uh, the issue is the same. 90% of people will ask, so what are the clients that you have on board? Uh, the clients will ask, what are the, drive, how, what are the numbers of drivers you have on board? So we, we tackle these problems uh, at the same time together uh, for both clients and drivers. So as a startup company, you don't have a lot of money uh, to do marketing, uh, whether you want to get drivers on board or whether you want to uh, get into the face of the client. So we've done a lot of interesting things. I think uh, one interesting thing when we did when we first started in order to get drivers was we found out there was a car owners expo. Uh, that was like the exact market that we wanted to tap into. Uh, but then when we went to reach reached out to the expo guys, they charged us almost a two thousand US dollars for a booth. And how do you have that kind of money, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, okay, so, we, so what we did was pretty smart. We still went to the event, but we didn't go upstairs, we went to the parking lot. We put flyers on every single car there. So, so, so you found a better way to, you know, you yeah, we, 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 we spent less than $10 on all the flyers. That's, that's very interesting. So, yeah. so once you got the idea and the, the whole, you know, business model in place, uh, how did you raise finance? What, what did you do immediately? How did you uh, guys go ahead? Yeah. Um, before getting into that, I want to share about the client side a little bit. Sure. <laughs> uh, so when we reached out to clients, uh, we uh, we did have a good number of drivers on board. I think uh, within our first month, we managed to get over a thousand cars on board uh, within the KL area. That was the most of the advertising was happening. And what we found out was we reached out using uh, LinkedIn marketing, that sort of thing, to the head of marketing of all the big companies. So one of the, we, we, we thought really big, we thought okay, the first client we're going to get is Maxis. Maxis is like basically oh. the Dirab of uh, Bolivia. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the reason was not because uh, we thought, okay, we could land Maxis from right from the yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. I'm, what were you thinking? Because you, if, if I remember correctly, you are a Lynx cap mentor as well, right? So yeah. when you go and knock on the door of Maxis, you know for a fact that you are not going to get this deal, right? So <laughs> because you are not going to every average business, right? So what were you actually expecting to get there, get done? No, th that's the whole point. I mean, we weren't expecting if we do get a deal, then that's a miracle. Uh, but even if we don't, what we get, the expertise that we get from Maxis is second to none. So right from that meeting, we learned that oh, they don't really care about our whole technology platform. All they care about is uh, the legitimacy of the drivers. Uh, and when we showed our tech platform, we basically had a PowerPoint presentation of a tech platform we had given built yet. Uh, so with, with that information, they, we asked them directly. So out of all these features, you can see the hours people are driving, where people are driving. What do you really want to get, right? So from that, we knew, OK, we need to prioritize the heat map feature. We don't really need to prioritize the hours spent feature. So with that, because we had limited resources, we had one developer who was just graduating from their degree. Uh, we knew exactly what to tell them. Hey, you don't need to build the whole thing. We just need this first. Uh, so that's why we went. So the whole point of a lean startup is getting customer validation. Right? So, 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 so you weren't there to get punched on your face, but still get some weather the data, right? Exactly. So you know, if you do get punched on your face, you come, come back with something, you know? You, you failed at closing the deal, but you learned so much more. And maybe you saved yourself, saved oh, ourselves. Next investment, right? Yeah, uh, months of development time uh, and wasting our time, basically. That is a very interesting way of going to it because I, I have seen a lot of people who are attempting to build scarf. They start with the tech, right? Mm. The, the minute they have an idea, they go and build a product, they will build an app, they will build a website or something. And by the time they take it to their client, this is not what the client wants. And what you have done is the complete opposite of that. And that is what you should do, right? You, you do the validation first, right? What customer is looking for and what you need to build, right? So that is, that is brilliant, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think one thing that I uh, would like to share with everyone is like, if you want to build a tech platform, you don't need to have the tech know-how in order to sell the tech platform. All you need to be is good enough to basically uh, create a mock-up of how it would look like and then sell it to them. When the, when the client is ready to pay money for it, then you worry about, okay, how am I going to make this a reality? Otherwise, you are just wasting your time and resources, right? Building something exactly. nobody wants. There are a lot of startups that are in... Uh, what they call uh, stealth mode because I'm busy building the tech for the company. I don't want to uh, let anybody know about it. Yeah, I'm not telling anybody because I'm building the next big thing, right? So exactly. I don't even want anybody to know. And, the, and, the, and ironically, the, what happens here when you build this in stealth mode and yeah. when you tag it out there, nobody wants to use it. Exactly. So, so, so go out there, talk to people, get it validated, right? So, because if, if you are, if we have this concept called the copycat entrepreneurs, which is not, not a bad thing, by the way, because what they are doing is they are taking a model which is working somewhere else and they, they are replicating it, right? Yeah. But, but the challenge for most people is, and even for you, I think, would be how, how are you going to differentiate people who are just copying you from yourself, right? How, how are you actually going to make that move? How are you going to keep driving your innovation? Yeah. I think uh, he's totally right. After we came out, uh, my mom came out as well. We were the first in the market. Uh, and especially today, first move advantage doesn't mean much. Uh, one year later, we had eight others in the industry, which got us scared as well. Uh, so we decided early on, okay, what, is, what are we good at? What should we focus on? Uh, so we focus mostly on transparency and lead data back to the client, as well as providing real value to our drivers. So when you go and mark, when we went and marketed ourselves to uh, drivers to register with us on my platform, it, in the beginning it was just earn a little bit of extra income while you're on the road. Maybe this could subsidize your petrol or subsidize the parking fees that you pay. Uh, but later on, once we talk to these customer validation again, uh, drivers, we call them brand ambassadors. Uh, the brand ambassadors tell us, oh, this has really helped me to pay off my car loan. Monthly installments of my car. This really helped me. Now I don't have to worry about the 
uh, parking fee that I need to pay for my office building every month. And and I think it, I think the advantage you have up there is the way you pitch, right? Because yeah. there there are so many ways to go and pitch. One one way is you take a flyer and you could say you would earn about two hundred more ringgits every month by being with us, right? Yeah. But the approach you have taken is in a more relatable way, right? Yeah. This could cover your petrol cost or the way you are paying for parking, so which which would be more relatable than it would make it easier for you to win them, right? Yeah. So. So what do you think about them in terms of pitching when acquiring customers? How important is it? Uh, it's very important. Uh, uh, what we learned is we got a lot more uh, registrations on the driver side as well when we actually try to relate it to problems that they have. I think uh, it's really pretty clear to you. Let's say you have a problem where your laptop's display is broken, and then you see an ad that says, "I'll pay you a thousand rupiah uh, by doing this and this and this." And then there's another ad that says uh, we fix laptop screen for free after you this this and this and this. You are much more likely to press the or uh, take action on the one that's actually catering to the problem that you have. So to understand the people's problem, whether it be clients, customers, or end users, it's always about uh, what are the problems you are solving for them and. Directing that exactly, you can't. Sometimes as a business, you can't really promise values in terms of 200 ringgit or 500 ringgit or whatever. But what you can promise is, hey, I'll subsidize your petrol cost. I'll subsidize uh, your monthly yeah. Yeah, fees and all stuff like that. Uh, even for the clients, we can't guarantee that uh, just because you advertise with us, uh, you're gonna get this much sales, right? But what we can guarantee is that if you do an Instagram ad. A person will swipe that ad in less than two seconds. But when you are stuck in a traffic jam, you you are stuck looking at that car in front of you for the duration of that traffic jam. And, and just to build on that, right? And, and when you are acquiring drivers, actually, you you have multiple ways that you could market your app, right? One way is social media advertising is very free, right? You yeah. could just go online, put an ad there. We are hiring drivers. You could earn this and this and this, and this right? Yeah. So why why did you actually decide to go and reach out to the persons? To reach out to them in person, right? Because yeah. I think it would be in terms of cost, it would be less for you to do a Facebook ad. Uh, in terms of cost, the reason why I'm asking you this is because a lot of people, especially in Maldives, they they come up with an app or startup and they'll just you know put up an ad on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is, then and then they expect people to come and use it. Uh, true. I mean, uh, it, it, the thing is, you can put money on a Facebook ad. But then, uh, and it's zero effort basically, just design the ad, design the caption, put it up there. But even if you had extremely running ads, you can see the success percentage is less than 5%. Right? So at the end of the day, that person, the, as an operations person as well, you have to look at the success criteria, no matter how much work you need to put into it. Uh, so what we found out was, uh, word of mouth marketing is best. And it does the more word of mouth marketing effort you put in, the less effort you need to put in. Right. It's basically a proportional effect. If you have ten people talking about your brand, then those ten people will talk to another people. That's like a hundred people, right? If you have a hundred people talking about your brand, talking to other another ten people, it's like a thousand people. So uh, on the driver side, to this day, in our four years of operations, I can say we haven't spent anything on marketing in terms of money. In terms of time, of course, we spent a lot. Still, yeah, kind yeah. of money, right? Anyways, uh, so so once you have some uh, drivers on board, yeah, uh, how did you get your you know close your first client? Oh, that's a very interesting story. So when we first uh, got our first uh, client on board, we were bootstrapping. Uh, me and Nadia uh, weren't paying ourselves anything. We were just trying to prove to ourselves as well: is this business going to work? And before you started, you you both were in corporates, right? Yeah, and then you you are taking a very high risk there because a lot of people tend to do it comfortably, right? I will just do this as a side hustle, right? So yeah. why did you go full time? Knowing that this is a very risky thing, uh, to me it sounds like a very stupid idea, right? So <laughs> what, what what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he's right. I mean, uh, it's a very difficult thing to jump out of the comfortable uh, chairs that corporates put you in. Uh, but the thing is, I believe to this day, if you're doing your startup idea as a side hustle, uh, it's going to take you not twice, but more than four times the amount of time it's going to take you to actually validate your business and get a client. Because at the end of the day, you want to meet clients, 
to sell your product, but you're stuck in a different office building and you can't go have that meeting uh, for that very reason, right? Um, and the, we wanted to validate the business as fast as possible. So it, me and uh, my co-founder, both of us took a leap of faith uh, and we gave us a timeline uh, of four months to, okay, can we get a client uh, to pay for this service? Can we get this many number of drivers to register with us? And can we, the main point was, can we make money out of this? Right? Uh, so when we got our first client, uh, it was a roaming telco company. I'm not sure if you guys know Flexiro. So Flexiro is a roaming telco company that has presence in over 100 countries. And it's a startup company as well, but they were much bigger than us. Um, so when we pitched to them, they really liked the idea and they ran with uh, 100 plus drivers and just to share with you we didn't have any technology back then but so no app nothing at this no point. app nothing but we just pitched, bluffing we were just bluffing yeah we were uh, we showed them a mobile app that drivers have which they didn't really have yet we showed them an advertiser dashboard that showed a heat map and showed the amount of impressions and mileage that uh, they would get uh, out of they would see in real time. Oh yeah, in real time was actually funny as well. We told them, uh, these numbers will update daily at midnight once a day, just as fast as how your bank updates your information in Malaysia. So uh, real time is real time, basically. So how we worked it out was, we didn't have an app, but we had a whole lot of phone, phone numbers and email addresses of people who registered on our website. So we actually emailed every single one of these uh, brand ambassadors to, hey, we have a campaign. Uh, with Flexurome, this is how the ad's gonna look like. Uh, if you are interested to take part in this campaign, please reply, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we got the replies, we put them all uh, in an Excel sheet, so we managed the whole campaign super manually. Uh, so every day after we got the uh, bumper sticker on their car and they were driving around, uh, me and my co-founder would actually uh, message them or call them up and ask, so where did you drive today? <laughs> uh, so in the afternoon, you were at this location, that location. Oh, can you send us a picture of your odometer every single day while you're driving as well? So every night, uh, my co-founder would spend time on an Excel sheet inputting everyone's odometer numbers and getting their mileage on a daily basis. And uh, I would be uh, take a screenshot, like, taking a screenshot of Google Maps and coloring certain areas based on where these people said they were driving. And as, as far as the client is concerned, I have all the data, right? This yeah. Car, then, yeah. Right. So they, they just log into a web page that I update every night at midnight, and the next day it's a it's an online app that works on a real time basis, right? Uh, and we got a lot of learnings from that as well. So at the end of the day, we learned that uh, even for the brand ambassador app that we were planning to develop, we didn't need a lot of features like getting drivers to register and uh, say that they're interested for a campaign, that was one of our main features, right? Get notified whenever we have a campaign via the app. We realized, hey, we could just do that by email. The, the difficult thing for us was calling them up and getting the numbers of uh, impressions versus mileage versus where they're driving. So the first version of our mobile app for our drivers, all they had was just a tracking button. So just, they just press the button, we collect the data, and that's it. We, it was super simple and we didn't take, took us less than two months I would say to design the advertiser dashboard as well as the mobile app and have it actually automated. Uh, so that's how we closed our first deal. That's, yeah. that's very interesting, very, very impressive uh, because like I said earlier, everybody is so, so, so much focused on building their tech, right? So what yeah. you have done is you validate the idea first and then you are trying to automate the process one by one, each, yeah. right? And then, um, and the advantage you have got is you have got the right essential features that you need to build, and exactly. that's a very and and you are building now uh, your MVP first, and then adding more features to it later on, right? I think everybody has to learn that is uh, technology is not something that you can basically drag and drop and have everything you need. Uh, you need to learn what what you need, what the client needs, what the users need, and that only comes by experimenting, by working with. Uh, Actual customers yeah, and, and actual users. And as long as it, it, it works at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how many fancy features you have because you are trying you're actually trying to solve the problem here, right? It and does matter. It does matter. If you spend waste a lot of time building fancy features, that means you wasted time not talking to customers. 
Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. What I'm saying is when, when, you're, when you're building, it doesn't really matter that you have a lot of fancy features yes. as long as you have the essence of features. Yeah, the key right? ones that they're looking for. For you guys, it was the tracking button, right? Yeah. That, that, that was it. Uh, we, when we when we first, I think all of us have this problem when we envision the app. It looks beautiful. It has ten thousand different features and ways that you can interact. And with I, it. I, and I don't think you guys even have an iOS app for a very very long time, right? Exactly. So we found out that the kind of people that are actually looking to earn income are Android users because iPhones are really expensive. So why build an iOS app uh, when eighty percent of uh, our brand ambassadors are Android users? So uh, we did an actually uh, interesting experiment to figure that out as well. Uh, on our website, we had a button for iOS and Android, right? So the moment they click, they want to download the app, they will click either one of those buttons. So we track how many people click that button versus the iOS button. But the moment they click it, we send them a message saying, oh, we're still working on the app. Uh, we'll let you know as soon as we But you want Yeah, Yeah, we didn't have an app. <laughs> Yeah, but we had that data to tell our developer as well. Okay, iOS we can totally delay because majority of people are pressing the Android button. Yeah. The only reason why we even built an iOS app later was, uh, well, we, we got way bigger. We, our clients that we go into the office meetings with, uh, they own iOS phones and they were looking for our <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not the drivers. Not the drivers. <laughs> right. So. So how how did you you know uh, go from there to uh, to get more new clients? To be, but so by now you have to close your first client. Yeah, um, I think after during the same time we were closing our first client was also the time that we were seeking funding because uh, the first client only gave us a short runway of an additional three to four months. Uh, so we needed that time to actually uh, we had, we have validated in the market. We've spoken to a lot of clients, we've gotten good feedback. A lot of the information that we got from the likes of Maxis and the big players were they wanted more case studies. They wanted to see the experience that we had gained with other clients. And, uh, so <coughs> we knew the market was there. It's just that we were very young. Um, so we were also fundraising. In Malaysia, there are a lot of uh, meetups and hangouts with investors where you can pitch uh, your startup idea to businesses. So we spent a lot of time. I would say we have almost you would have knocked on more than 50 to 100 doors of investors, uh, trying to pitch to them, trying to have coffee meetings with them. And how do you feel, you know, when they keep the same? No, don't you think it's time to you know, pack your bags and go home? Sometimes, uh, it's a really traumatic, I would say, experience. Uh, but you, you you build a certain level of resilience uh, dealing with all those no's. Uh, but when you do get that one yes, everything becomes worthwhile again. Uh, so we did pitch to a lot of investors and we had actually people come up to us and say that I want to hear more. And that was basically uh, that, that was basically it for us. We had people with both loads of cash that actually wanted to sit down at a coffee and learn about our progress. Even at that point we did basically it's not a one shot thing, you know, you can't just go to an investor and ask them for money and then they put in money. They need to build a relationship with you. And even for you as well, you don't want that kind of investor that basically throws in money at you and then hopes for the best. So we had a, uh, we discussed with many different uh, aspects of the business. They were asking me how were our team doing, uh, what were the client meetings we had. So I would say we had close to two months of just coffee sessions of us learning about each other. Because at the end of the day, investment is also a marriage. Because you will be, this investor will be uh, breathing down your throat at every AGM. So you need to make sure you have the right kind of attitude, the right kind of people uh, working with you in startup as an investor as well. Uh, so the investors that we did get were amazing angel investors that came on board. Um, and even today, and the reasons why that we decided to go with them as well was not only because we came to a negotiated uh, valuation that we could both agree on, but it was also because right off the bat, they came to the network of like over 20 clients that they could introduce us to. Right. And, and you're building the company as well, you're getting, getting more clients at this point, yeah. right? And there and are these big companies, you know, like Grab, Uber, who has a, who has a big, you know, driver base, right? So yeah. once you, 
the way I see it, you are doing homework for them, right? You are coming up with this new idea, you are validating for them, and instantly, just one day, they could roll out these services to millions of drivers, right? So, yeah. Why actually considering that scenario? Uh, yeah, we were, we were, we were. Well, uh, what, what are you gonna do? You know, this one fine day, Grab announces that we have this. You know, they are doing the same thing with uh, Grab Eat or yeah. Uber Eats and those things. Right? Just to, I'm not sure if you're familiar. Uh, what you're just grinding me on right now has actually happened. Grab recently, I think at the end of last year, launched Grab Ads, uh, which is basically doing exactly the same thing that we are, right? Uh, but what Grab doesn't have are clients that uh, appreciate on our side is they're not as specialized as we are. At, uh, oh, come on, that is what any small company would say, right? We, they wouldn't be able to give the specialized service we give. Yeah. Uh, yes, but we have the case studies to prove it to them as well. Right. And at the same time, uh, what we do for the clients is not just uh, slap on an ad for the car. And at the end of the day, Grab ads is being seen more as taxi advertising than it's being seen as consumer back advertising. Because even uh, right now, Grab drivers are required to be full time registered as taxi drivers. And our drivers are doing it uh, as a sign of control. And the number of the amount of money that they need, they are paid out, that the clients need to pay to advertisers is totally different from uh, our payment model as well. We pay on a low mileage basis, they are a flat lump sum fee. So basically, if a competitor comes up, uh, it's nothing to be scared about. I mean, it's okay, I'll be honest, I didn't get scared, but then it forces as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur to think deeply on. Okay, what make what's the differentiator between you and another competitor that has a boatload of cash? Uh, so for us, it was how special our technology platform was. Uh, although sure, but, but they could do the same technology platform, right? Or even better, or even a better one. Yeah, but what it, is your USP here? Our USP at the end of the day is currently our drivers. Uh, our drivers, uh, uh, the our pool can never be beaten by Grab. Because Grab needs drivers that have free time to pick passengers up and drop passengers off. So that number of percentage of drivers that are free to do all that versus the percentage of drivers that are driving around doing their regular thing, picking up their kids from school, dropping them off, going to malls, groceries. Those are the drivers that we are targeting and our numbers are always way bigger. So if a client wanted to do mass advertising uh, throughout the whole of KL, our numbers can guarantee that way more than Grab can. Yeah, because so because Grab drivers are more random, right? Whereas your drivers knows where they're going. Exactly. So uh, that's another reason why clients prefer us. So we have a uh, few clients that say, hey, I have a new outlet opening in this area of KL. I want drivers to drive around my outlet, right? If uh, with ride sharing drivers like Grab or Uber or whatnot, Nobody can guarantee that because they go where the passengers require demand. But our drivers, we have enough data on them to say that hey, this guy drives along this road every day. So this would be the perfect kind of driver to advertise for this outlet. Right? So those are the kind of unique uh, USPs that we can provide to our client that the likes of Grab still can't. Um, so, so after you raise financing, uh, yeah. Uh, how did how did you scale up actually your business from that? Okay. Uh, I'll just share with you, not having money to run your startup, there's something scarier than that. Having a lot of money to run your startup. Uh, it's actually a big problem as well. We've seen, uh, like I shared with you, one year after we launched, there were eight competitors, right? One year after that, there were only three. Uh, so including us, now there are four in the market in Malaysia. Uh, the reason being is we, we saw, uh, we had one competitor that got over a million in funding that totally scared us as well and they had their own plan all over the streets of KL <coughs> and, but, and basically they were getting a lot of popularity but what we were getting was, as a corporate company, I'm not sure if you know, uh, whenever you are sourcing for a vendor to get a job done you're always supposed to get more than one quotation, right? In Malaysia, it's three to five general quotations. 
so that's how we were getting our our word out. Whenever they were they found out about our competitor, a client would reach out to us as well. So uh, in a way, we we got marketing from the fact that they were doing marketing, and we had nothing to be afraid of uh, because in terms of our driver side as well, the rewards we were providing them were way better. So. As a consumer, whenever you see a product, you always want to see okay what else is out there before you make that decision to buy or to invest time in it, right? Um, when we when we got funding, uh, we raised money at a valuation of uh, how much would that be? About four million only per year, and we made mistakes uh, managing money as well. Uh, luckily to say that. Uh, We've spoken to founders uh, in different startup industries, so we learned a lot from them. I think that's the whole point of startup grind as well. Uh, we spoke to few founders of startups. We met at startup grind. We had coffee sessions after with them, and they shared their experience of mismanaging money, or hiring the wrong kind of people, or throwing too much money in Facebook ads for limited results. Uh, so the, the the minute you get money, you are quickly you know in the drive mode, right? You want to yes. get a lot of customers on board. You want to get the transactions coming exactly. up. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, right. so okay. that is a mistake, right? Yeah, it was a mistake. I will share with you. Uh, me and my co-founder had no experience doing sales. Right? I come from a operational background, a project management background, a tech background. My co-founder comes from a legal background. So we had no experience in sales. Uh, so we thought the best thing we could do was hire somebody with over 13 ex years of experience. Uh, in the industry, uh, in sales and advertising. So uh, what we learned was these veterans in the industry. They have a lot of relationships. They have a lot of contacts. Uh, but they are in an age-old industry. They've been selling billboards. They've been selling airtime. But when it comes to selling private car ads on the road in real time, they don't know what to do, and they are worried to sell this to their relationships in case they might look bad. Right. So we spent a lot of money on these kind of uh, salespeople and got zero uh, return for it. Later on, we hired a few interns to do sales, and these guys were doing thousand cold calls a day, uh, ten meetings a, a week, and these guys were doing a lot more work and bringing in uh, much bigger leads because they were hungry, they were new, they were fresh, and they liked this sort of brand new idea. And they were not afraid of failure. And yeah, the the thing with people who are corporate, it's it's not an offensive thing to anybody who works in the corporate. They are they are they are actually uh, willing to take less risks than people who are startup, right? Because yes. I think the same is in your case as well. Because uh, they have much more to lose here, right? But if you hire an intern, if you hire who have more startup mindset, they have not, they are willing to take the risk, right? Because any anybody who actually wants to start a startup or do a startup, one thing is you have to be willing to take the risk and willing to fail, right? Exactly. And your interns, I think, were willing to fail. Yeah, I think as a startup as well, one one thing that we actually have printed on our walls for our whole team is fail fast, succeed faster. So even if you think you're gonna fail, just do it, just get it done, uh, and then find out okay why did you fail, and that learning is gonna help you succeed the next time you do it. Right? Don't be afraid of trying it just because uh, okay, you're not sure whether this is going to work, you're not entirely 100% sure whether things are going to break down, people are going to hate it. Uh, there have been times where you've done ads uh, and had nobody basically interact with the ad. But then we are like, uh, hey, why don't we change a little bit, just change the card but uh, button's color to green, see how that works. Then when we do things like that, we are able to release an ad in less than two days or less than a day sometimes and iterate on the same ad until it brings us more results. Whereas a corporate company might be working on a three month uh, project in order to launch one ad. Right. Uh, so yeah, I want to share about uh, when we were talking about our investors uh, and having discussions with them, uh, one thing that really helped close the deal was we got a really big contract. Uh, for Malaysia, one of Malaysia's biggest air conditioner companies called York Air Conditioner. They wanted a campaign throughout Malaysia. Penang, Johor Bahru, this is like really far away at the other ends of Malaysia. Uh, and we didn't even have drivers then, but we totally told the client that we can do it, right? So, uh, do, do it too, you said you have the drivers. Yeah, of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. So, uh, so we we basically drove off all the way to Penang the next day to uh, talk to people on the streets and malls and whatnot and uh, spread out flyers. And it was a bit easier this time around because we already had a guaranteed campaign from these guys, right? So. Uh, we drove off to Penang and then we drove off to the other end, to Johor Bahru, and we got these drivers on board. Uh, and then uh, after we launched the campaign, we again sat down with our investors and said, hey, we just launched the biggest contract that we've gotten to in our lifetime. Let's post this deal, or otherwise our revolution is going to go up. So uh, uh, we, we had a lot of learnings from uh, working with these kind of big brands as well as the insights and information shared with our investors. Uh, then, the, when once the deal was closed, or uh, once we got the investment, we actually our investors was nice enough to give us a free office space to work out of for a year as well. Um, we used uh, every single dollar that we spent on marketing or even in operations. Uh, we put a percentage success criteria on it. So, uh, for example. So you clearly know what, what to do and what not to do, right? Yeah, exactly. So for example, if you were using flyers, right? No single flyer campaign would have the same URL. The reason being, we want to find out, okay, we spread out these flyers to this area. Uh, how successful were they? Uh, was the design successful or was the people in this area more receptive? So we wanted to learn everything that we can. So uh, even when we do, uh, reaching out to clients. Every single sales call that we make needs to be scripted. And then we spend a whole week using this script and see how many people say, say yes to a meeting. And then we try out a different script and see what percentage of people say yes to this script. Right. Then we know what's successful, right? Right, so, so you started about in 2015 or 16, right? Yes. So it has been about four years now already. So. <laughs> So uh, at, at any point in this, you know, four years, because you would have your ups and downs, you, you know, at, at any point in this four years, did you think that there's time to, you know, pack your bags and go home? Every other day. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, no, there are, there are times when uh, you feel helpless, but uh, I think once you decided to take that leap of faith, you will face new problems every day. And then every day you will think this is the problem that this is the biggest problem you'll ever face until you get to tomorrow. So uh, it builds a resilience, uh, and then you also. I think the only thing about I'm not I don't want to scare you guys, but there's always a simpler solution than the solution you're thinking of. Or to put it on the other end, there's always uh, a leaner way. A leaner way, yeah. But there's a lean startup concept uh, that a lot of startups what they want to think about is every problem has a solution but every problem doesn't have a custom. So the lean startup way is putting it on the other side which is uh, every solution has a problem and every problem has a custom. So how that works is basically don't look at solving every problem that exists in the world but look at solving the finding the solution that people are willing to pay for, that, that people have the itch for. So, for example, if you have a, uh, I, let me give you a minor example. We faced a really difficult time uh, when, before we were not just an on the road platform, we also had a social media component to our business. So, all these drivers that were driving around with the brand would even share selfies of themselves uh, with the brand products or with the shop or with the ad on their car and put it on social media and we will get the metrics of how many people see it on social media as well. So this was like, you're not advertising on Facebook, you're doing word of mouth on Facebook. right? And with ads, there are ad blockers. With the kind of service we are providing, you can't block them unless you delete the friend. Yeah. So, uh, what we faced was, uh, Facebook went through this thing with Cambridge Analytica and then they closed down all their APIs, uh, no other 
third party developer could get access to the data. And we basically had to shut down a side of our business. And that was a really tough time for us. Uh, I think months and months of hard work by our team to educate drivers on how the social media side works, the tech team building in the APIs to connect everything together, and us. We even lost, I would say, 50,000 ringgit of contracts that we were in talks with to close just because Facebook closed down the APIs. Right? Uh, so it required us to wake up one day and decide, okay, there's nothing we can do about it. It's not like we can build a different social network. So it's time to retarget our whole messaging and fo focus more on yeah. what is working right now. Yeah, you have to somewhat pivot, right? Yeah, we have to pivot. Yeah. And, and that's the point. Uh, you got to be ready to iterate your business on how the market is acting. Uh, our case with Facebook was an external factor that we couldn't do anything about, but there are internal factors or the customers wanting new things. Like for example, now our customers, all of them want 3D couples on top of their car. Right? That was something that we really didn't want to do, but now we are doing that too because that's what the clients want. So, if you are a corporate company that had SOP set in place since the beginning of time, you can't really launch a totally new business service overnight. In one, overnight, yeah. yeah. So, and for my mom, we just spent a day uh, getting learning that's how it works, and then we had it on our website. Media kit and that's the one of the advantages which you, when you are in competition with companies like that, right? Because yeah. they will be able to do it in even in a few months, right? Exactly. Grab considered them, considered themselves a startup, but now they are so big that uh, we are hundred percent sure we can move faster than them. So, uh, tell us about some of the biggest clients you know you have worked with and how you actually managed to close them as well. Because uh, yeah, um, I think the the proudest client that we have would be Disney. Uh, we actually ran campaigns with them for their Cars Three movie. We are already uh, in talks with them to hopefully close Avengers. Uh, that would be a dream come true for me. <laughs> um, so. Uh, uh, Disney was uh, that doesn't never works directly with any brand, so we went through media agency after media agency, and they have what you need to learn is uh, they have really rigorous uh, assessments that they do you on you as well. So we had to uh, basically uh, make sure that we came up with SOPs just for the sake of running these media campaigns. That that's a lot of different things that we had to do. We had to vet our and Disney's requirements were totally different, right? So normally we have drivers that drive around certain area. Disney for Cars 3, they just told us up front, we want parents of kids be, uh, below the age of 12. And they were like, okay, sure, we can run a survey and find that. Oh, and we also we want to make sure they go and pick up their kids to and from school on a daily basis. And imagine as a, <laughs> as a vendor, how are you going to find these kind of people, right? But we actually did it. We managed to uh, WhatsApp every single one of our drivers that matched the other requirements that we already could get out of them. And show, we actually asked them, hey, can you show proof that you have a kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, what I'm trying to say is when you're a startup company, when you're trying to land big deals like this, you need to you go above and beyond. Yeah. You will be within to tech. Yeah, we need to go above and beyond. And as a startup company, because it's just you guys, you don't have a lot of bureaucracy or red tape or SOPs you need to follow. So you just get it done. Right. So what do you see for you know my dom in the future? Where, where are you guys in, you know, in terms of when you start it? Is this how you thought it would go? I think when you are running a startup, you get good at every time we, we, we come up with the startup, we have this plan or at least in our head, right? You know. In one year's time, we'll do this, and five years' time, I'll do this, and you know, it's very, very, you know, ambitious. So, is this how you thought it would go? Uh, yes and no. I mean, when you first start up, you think of really big things, right? I was hoping by the end of the first year, we would be in 10 different countries. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it's, but at the same time, uh, you are bigger than you realize. And as a startup founder, sometimes when you're so busy uh, fighting fires uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't really get the time to appreciate where you've gotten. 
uh, until somebody comes and says, hey, wow, you guys are all over in Malaysia now. And I was like, oh yeah, we are. <laughs> right? That, that happens even to this day. Um, uh, hey guys, you have like one third of all the drivers uh, in Salango, for example. And then they're like, oh yeah, we do. You know? um, so it might not be the achievements that you envisioned that you were going to have when you first started. But even for us, when we look back, hey, it's only been three years. And now we have a team of 10 people that are working on this with us that believe uh, that this is an actual thing and this can become way bigger than uh, even we thought it could. As well as we have a pool of more than 50,000 drivers that are catching up with us every day, asking us what our client. We even have drivers that tell us, hey, we have a client that might be interested in working with you. So now we have like referral programs with our brand ambassadors. And those are the kind of things I would never even thought of when I started. You know? That keeps multiplying, right? Yeah, it, it keeps multiplying. And I think it's an important thing uh, that as a founder as well to appreciate but how far you've come. Uh, I don't know if there are people who are running startups as well uh, here, but take some time out of your day to appreciate how far you've come and that gives you better insight into what are the next steps you should take. Because that dream that you had of launching your business into 10 different countries, it's, it needs to change based on where you are right now. Right. And that, that makes it more achievable. Right. So next I have the million dollar question which I asked you know, a big star founder. Oh no. That the whole, you know, thinking on ideas, you know, what do you think of ideas? I mean, there are so many people who Who's out there with you know this billion dollar ideas who are not willing to share? So can I ask all of you like how many of you are startup founders right now? Oh, we've got a good number here. How many of you have an idea for a startup? Just an idea. Just an idea of a startup. startup. Don't be shy. I'm not going to ask you what the idea is. <laughs> the, the whole thing on you know yeah. skill in ideas. I yeah. know your opinion. Yeah. Uh, the answer is very simple. Ideas are shit. It's cheap. Uh, execution is everything. Uh, at the end of the day, if five, all five of you that raise their hands with an idea might have the same idea, right? But it all depends on whether you execute and how you execute, right? As long as there are a lot of people that say, hey, I have this really awesome idea, or oh, but this other startup started it, so I can't do anything about it. That's totally wrong. Um, how sure are you that the idea that you had in mind, that the others that you see implementing it are implementing it right? And, and I think in terms of ideas and technology, we have seen the same ideas, I think even since 90s, 80s, so yeah. 90s, because it's, it's just a matter of how you, you present it. To exactly, I mean, how amazing is Lava Foshi, right? I, idea wise, <laughs> if you think about it, uh, Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, they're doing the same thing, right? It's about how they do the presentation is different, right? So ideas, like you said, are very, very, very cheap. And the, the problem, the reason why I keep asking this is because there are so many people out there in this country who has ideas, but they are not willing to share, right? Yeah. And they are they're worried about that the idea might be stolen, yeah. and then they can't even do anything about it. Yeah, exactly. so, so get your ideas out there and do something about it, right? Definitely. I mean, I think the first thing you guys need to, uh, everybody needs to realize is that uh, nobody can uh, you don't need to be worried about uh, people stealing your ideas. You need to be more uh, thinking about more about, okay, if I share this idea, what are the opportunities I would get? So even when me and my co-founder had nothing but just the idea, we were coming to these kind of events like Startup Ride and even bigger events and talking to people and saying, hey, we have an idea, we are thinking of ways on how to implement it. And we actually got collaboration opportunities with other people that were in the industry. For example, uh, you might meet a guy who is running a car club just as a hobby, you know, bringing together car people together. And you might run a collaboration with them just because you shared that idea, right? Uh, and a lot of doors can open just because you were willing to open share. up about the idea, just share. Exactly, and, and since you have, you know, raised some funds as well, you have got an investor as well, uh, let's talk about some of the basics of the industry. Investments, right? Okay. In here, what I see right now is people just talking about idea and finding an investor, right? So, uh, 
I, I, and idea is not an investable thing, right? So yes. how, how, how long would you say to go before, you know, how, how much work do we need to do before actually reaching out to an investor, would you say? Um, I would say uh, building relationships with investors is a good idea in the moment that you know that uh, you yourself realize that I want to put in everything into... And in terms of product. product. Yeah. In terms of product. In, in terms of product as well, even though you might not have the finished product, but you yourself have put in, uh, got customers ready to pre-order, or you've already pre-sold and people have bought into it. Uh, basically what I want to say is you need to show money to investors. You can't get, uh, there, there are very rare cases where some people get money on an idea, but there are 90% of those rare cases end in the product failing because the entrepreneur themselves don't know how to make money. How to make money, right? Uh, a lot of startups in Malaysia as well, they get a, a huge investment at a runway of 12 months, but then they need to shut down because they were unable to monetize. So I think the most important thing for you and for an investor as well is to uh, have monetary proof and have a roadmap of how you're going to make money. So, and it works in your advantage as well. And there are a lot of founders that say, oh, I couldn't work on my idea because I couldn't get an investor to invest in myself. Uh, but the more monetary proof and traction you have for your business, the less chunk of a business you lose to your investor. And to be honest, uh, I've seen founders and entrepreneurs lose interest in their business because at the end of the day, no matter how successful it gets, you're only getting 20% or 10% of the pie. Right. For us, we didn't raise, we bootstrapped, uh, we pulled in whatever money we had and we didn't pay ourselves anything until we were able to get negotiated valuation that we were all happy with and we told our investors up front as well, if you take up more than con the controlling interest of the company, what are we making up for? Right. So even for yourself, if you can't decide the direction of the company yourself, uh, you are less inclined to be interested in the business. So when talking to investors, I think first thing you need to know is you need to know your numbers. You need to know why you need the money as well, right? How you have to spend the money. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming that's a basic thing. Yeah, of course, course you should. Generally, you know, yeah. generally when people, I, I don't think so, I could be wrong as well. Yeah. I've seen people come in and asking for money, but they don't know how they are utilized they're going to utilize the money, right? So it's like, okay, I'm going to ask for one million rupee and then by the time I get one million rupee, and then I'm going to figure out how I'm going to spend the one million rupee. Yeah, that's a complete no no. I, I mean, you need to be able to justify every single cent of the money that you're asking for to the extent of, okay, I want to spend, let's say, 200,000 on advertising. Then you need to have the answer of, okay, how many users or clients do you aim to get with that 200,000 spend? Right. So those are, I would say, basic things that you need to know before you even speak to an investor. But most important thing is you need to have numbers. Uh, you don't need to, don't have projections, but actual numbers of uh, clients that you have worked with or users you have already registered, that, that sort of thing. Uh, right. Should we open up the floor? Yeah, I was thinking about that. So now that we have, you know, discussed yeah. major things, uh, we'd open, for, open up for any questions. Audience. Anyone? Yes. Yeah. I think we have a mic over there. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, there will come a point when you need to focus on other things 
and you you not being able to show up for the photo shoots or whatnot, uh, become the prop, uh, you are becoming the bottleneck for the marketing department, right? Having an ambassador, a mascot works for. Uh, it depends on the kind of com company that you are starting up. Uh, for my work, we are targeting more towards businesses. Uh, we are B two B in terms of monetary transactions and all that. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for us to invest in creating a mascot or a cartoon character or some sort of that sort of thing to uh, empathize with big companies. But if you're a B2C company, I've seen a lot of companies gain success by uh, creating mascots for their brand to relay messages, to show up in ads. I think one example would be... That's the company that uses a mascot. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> think of but that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't. I don't think it works because we don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, uh, it helps cater to the message. But at the end of the day, uh, the marketing should always relate back to the customer. And that doesn't really need a face. That doesn't really need a ma mascot. I think uh, even when, just to name drop Dirago as well, when they do ads, they try to relate as much and to the end consumer and their behavior when they show us their ads most of the time. And just to have one more thing there, I, I, I could give you an example of you know a case where I can work very well with our mascot. Uh, hotel, Trivago. So you don't really need a mascot, you know, they have they have done it very well. In fact they have gone to the extent where they're doing it in Korean language. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Uh, yeah, the work ethic question, right? Uh, there are good days and bad days. <laughs> uh, so, with regards to work ethic, uh, I think the most important thing as a company and as for me as well, I don't care what time uh, our employees show up to work. I don't mind if they come in after lunch or they leave before the sun is, uh, I mean, like 3 or 4 p.m. either. So, our whole company, even for myself, the requirement is you have a set number of tasks we, that we decide every week that every team member, every department that needs to complete, even I myself need to complete. And you are judged based on how much of that were you able to complete. So the, the requirement is basically 100%. If you have any less than that, then you need to justify that. But I don't mind if you don't show up to work at all during the week, if you are able to achieve that 100%. So, uh, even for us, we only have one day for meetings, which are on Fridays, or we work Fridays. Uh, every other day, uh, if there is a meeting, I actually go into the meeting room and ask, why the hell are you having this meeting? You guys should be working. Because I believe meetings, especially uh, learning from my own corporate environment, I've sat down at meetings that last four to five hours and get nothing done, uh, and have to work late nights, uh, get delayed to the next week. Uh, so meetings are a no-no unless it's super urgent. Uh, so work ethic wise, personally for me, there are days when I get nothing done when I'm just brainstorming and pacing around the office and maybe even, uh, what's a nice way of putting it, checking up on other people's work. <laughs> uh, but there are days when I totally zone everybody out and uh, make sure everything that needs to get done is done. So even when I'm in Maldives, even today, this morning, uh, I was nosing around on everybody's work, had a call with every single one and making sure uh, the requirements for the whole week were complete. So Friday, uh, I'm not sure if you know Sprints. So we do this thing where every Friday we demo, everybody has to present, oh, these are the things I managed to complete the Sprint. If you're in marketing, you have to show, uh, I did this marketing campaign, this is the result of the marketing campaign. Uh, operations and all that. Everybody shows up. And then at the end of the meeting, we do another planning session for the next week. So that's when we set. Okay, these are the 20 things you need to complete by the end of this week. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's, I hope that answers your question. I'm, I, I avoided it by talking about the company operations and not my own work ethic. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Danish. Um, just wanted to ask you, I'm an entrepreneur, right, in Mali, I have my own business here. Right? Awesome. A very big challenge that I face sometimes is that when we work with a consultant, or when we work with even our internal team, 
I try to instill motivation in the people we work with. What do you do and what are your ideas on carrying this out in a long term perspective? And how to maintain that, what would you call it, that motivation, like that internal sense of you. Keep them driven, right? Yes, exactly. It's a good question. I think uh, I'm learning about that more and more as well. Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, one thing that I try to do is at least I read one, minimum one book a month yeah, about entrepreneurship, business and management. I've tried positive reinforcement, I have tried negative reinforcement and failed terribly. <laughs> uh, I think the most important thing what I've learned is every employee or team member is happy when they know that uh, you trust them and they have the ability to make a difference. So, for example, uh, just to share with you the, the site that handles our marketing, I, once the marketing is uh, handed to him, it's like, okay, we need to get, uh, we need to reach out to at least 100 clients that are in Penang, uh, brands that are in Penang, right? After that, that is the task. How he does it, uh, how long, uh, how long is that sprint, but how he does it, how he managed to pull it off, how much uh, of other team members or help he needs to bring in, I will ask him. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about do it whatever way we want. I trust you to bring in these 100 clients or 100 leads into my mom, uh, and close the deal. So when, when I started doing things that way, instead of basically spoon feeding by them by saying, hey, uh, call up these companies, uh, make sure they, they set a time for a meeting, when I leave it open ended and they take ownership of the way that the way that the, way, the work that they need to do, they are a lot more open to uh, and more a lot more driven to get it done. So and there are times when they fail. Uh, especially when they don't want to follow your way and they want to do it their own way. Uh, your, you don't know whether your way is correct either. It's just your assumption that okay, this is the way it should work. You might be talking from your own experience, but you are not letting them decide on one way that they are more comfortable with. So there are times when they have got much better results than I'm expected, but even when they don't bring in the results that uh, was asked of them, it's always good to then ask during the demo session, okay, so you failed. So what did you learn from that? How can you succeed in the next sprint, right? So uh, you get a lot of, they, then you are forcing them to realize their own mistakes, and you are forcing them to come up with something better themselves. So basically, um, I think even when it's a simple task, right? If it were a corporate environment and you needed to print t-shirts for an event, the designer would print the t-shirts. The head of department would need an approval. The C the everybody above that would have to do an approval. And then only after that, uh, some other guy has to get quotations. And some other guy is handed off to get it done and deliver it. And by the time, the guy that was initially required to do that t-shirt printing job would only see it but after everybody is wearing it, right? Uh, but when you hand one guy the job of designing, printing and getting it done, you are trusting them to roll it up. There are, and as a startup founder, you actually don't even have the time to review everybody's work. You actually have to trust them to get it done. So I think what drives our team at least is knowing that they have the freedom to uh, do it any way they want. And sometimes it backfires on me too. They come and uh, when I give them a task, they come and tell me, so what's the point of doing this for my work? And to a certain extent, that, that leaves me like, okay, now I need to justify, rethink the reason why I came up with this task. But in another aspect, it's a good thing. Now you have team members, that are actually thinking about what value everything that they do brings to the company. So, why don't you give that a try and see if it works? Hi, Shaf, you speaking from Articles.com. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, 
it's not a very technical question which I really have. So I'm having this uh, code for like many years, at least let's say five years since I came from Bangalore. Uh, so like we have so many challenges in all this, right? Transportation, healthcare, uh, have road safety, uh, and all of top we have politics is our biggest challenge to solve, right? So like if, if you see like outside all this, let's say uh, Europe. Uh, maybe uh, United States or other developed nations. I think uh, tech startups have changed a lot of things, right? So I think you have come across this front because you would also have thought of a lot of different things. So as developers, as uh, tech startups or whichever the startups, what do you think we should do in Maldives in order to improve these things across uh, the whole uh, country itself in general? Because I really find it very sad to see a lot of good people live in this country in terms of technical, I know engineers in UK, uh, doctors, specialists in the United States and all these places, Singapore, Australia, the list goes on, New Zealand also. So how, what do you think we should do uh, to, to, to bring this back or maybe to, to, to come up with something that could uh, eventually help us to improve in terms of technology? That's my question actually. So I haven't found any solution to that, just wondering. I usually ask this question to all of people. So, so your question is how can we improve technology in Maldives? Yeah, in general, like how are we gonna like do this in general? Like, uh, I think uh, one thing, especially from a developer's perspective, is you think that every problem can be solved with the help of technology? Uh, no. Okay, fine. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to say was technology is not always the answer. And solving every problem is also not the answer, right? Um, so I, I, I've tried, I've had this problem as well, uh, where even in the Maldives, you're trying to fix every problem with the help of technology, but then you face roadblocks, whether it be uh, people are not interested, or the uptake is not there, or maybe the roadblock might even be political, right? Um, so it's a step-by-step -step process. You can't solve every single problem uh, at the same time. And when you think about, okay, there are problems in transportation that uh, could be shipping, could be post, could be many logistics, uh, could be even transparency problems as well. Uh, but you got to find out as an individual or as a startup founder, what is the problem that you really want to solve or that really needs solving, right? If I work on the problem of uh, solving the transportation issue, uh, is that a problem that I'm really passionate about? And you've got to take it one step at a time. And even though you face issues on a political standpoint or whatnot, you've got to find out... Uh, so I've, I've had these discussions with even uh, policy makers in Malaysia where I have this problem, hey, let's find a way to solve this problem. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have their own problems. That's what I learned. Right? So when I go to them and try to solve my problems, I'm faced with the... Uh, closed door. But when I go to them and solve their problems, every, uh, it's basically you're using technology to inadvertently improve the technological infrastructure of whichever company that you are seeking help from, and that in turn helps the technology that you're trying to build and integrate with them. Uh, one very simple example is uh, when my mom, we needed to reach out to the authorities in Malaysia about traffic, about putting ads on cars, and they had this regulation where every single ad that goes on the road uh, needed to be approved by the, the authorities. And it was a very lengthy process. Every single car needed to fill out an application forms, show pictures of the car with the ad on, just the car without the ad on, and that was super long. And now we are in talks with them to automate the whole thing, because it solves the problem for them as well. So we, have, we do tell them that, hey, uh, we have a problem of uh, putting the ads on because your approval method is still so slow. We went to them and said, hey, do you want to improve your operations in terms of approving ads? Right? And after that's done, we can go and tell them, uh, okay, we're going to be throwing you a lot of applications now. <laughs> right. uh, I think what, uh, to answer that question, they try to think of the other perspective of the person you're trying to solve the problem for or the perspective of the roadblock that you might be facing and solve the problem for them. And don't do everything at once. Try to solve one problem at a time.
Anything else? Yeah. Um, if, we, if we don't have any, any questions from the audience, uh, yeah. we have. Ah, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, yes, sir. Hello. Uh, going back to the question about risk. So, uh, coming from a corporate background, myself as well, uh, as we know, corporates are very risk averse, right? And startups are, by definition, should be risk prone. Risk prone, right? <laughs> Having a risk. <laughs> embracing risk. Yes, right? embracing yes. But um, uh, the approach is different for every startup. So, what is your approach to balance this delicate situation where? You find out when you come to work tomorrow, you want to make I can spend the whole 200,000 ringgit budget for the whole year on t shirts. You know, like how do you make sure that this is the, how do you strike the balance in your company, in my mom? And the second question is for, uh, because you have been involved in startups, startups and different uh, enterprises for a while, even features and stuff, how do you know when to quit? That is, it's, it's a very difficult question, but not everything succeeds, right? But when you when do you decide when it's not going to work out and when you want to switch over, uh, you know, move on? Um, yeah, to answer your first question, uh, with regards to where do you strike the balance of are you being embracing risk or just being stupid, right? <laughs> uh, so everything that we do at MyBob, we treat it as an experiment. So there's this uh, one mantra in Lean Startup that says, uh, in the past, everybody believed entrepreneurship was an art. You need to have a certain amount of charisma to do entrepreneurship, to do sales, certain kind of personality. But uh, the Lean Startup changes that totally to say that entrepreneurship is not an art, it's a science. You're running experiments, you're testing what works, what doesn't work. Um, so, uh, whenever, whether it be marketing, whether it be operations, uh, whenever somebody suggests, hey, let's do this, let's change how we do operations by uh, maybe dealing with the client first or maybe talking to the client later. Uh, and then I always tell them, okay, let's do that, but always remember that this is an experiment, which means we need to see results at the end. Every experiment is, as a scientist, you do experiments and you have a result, whether it worked, it didn't work. You have a percentage of success or failure. So even when it comes to marketing, before you throw on throw in that two hundred thousand ringgit budget into marketing, why don't we spend a smaller thousand ringgit budgets on ten different things and get the percentage success rates and throw the rest of the hundred and ninety thousand into uh, what percentage worked? I mean the experiment that worked. To answer your second question. And that's uh, something that I struggle with every day as well. Um, how, when do you quit, right? I, I honestly, yeah. Not necessarily with the company, but just the, you know, some feature or idea that you have that, you know, the experiment is like, is it an experiment? How do you define when, when it's time to move on? Because some of us, I mean, I've also struggled with a couple of startups, except the one I'm in right now, where the answer failed. So, when do you decide that, hey, my idea isn't working anymore, the market has changed, or my idea was shit, yeah. but when do you decide that, hey, nobody wants it? I think uh, that, that makes it up a bit easier. Uh, you need to, uh, the first thing that I tell every single startup that I mentor as well is, do not be in love with your idea. Right? If you are the person loving your idea, then you will see that no fault in it. And when you validate your idea, do not go and ask your friends or your parents whether this is a good idea. Of course, they'll say yes, right? You have to go out and talk to actual people that are willing to pay you money to use your service or product, whether this is something that's going to work. And trust, trust the data and not your own feelings. Because that's the thing, it's not an art anymore, it's a science. So even when it becomes talking about a feature, you might have an amazing idea for a feature that you think will revolutionize the world. But uh, we've had that in our team, so I've come up with ideas, our team members have come up with ideas. Um, so I have two questions as well. My first question is, um, what, what are some of your strategies that you use uh, to retain your uh, you know, clients and also your customers, like for example, your ambassadors? Oh. I mean, um, 
I'm assuming you would have to be, you know, quite innovative um, to, you know, maintain your uh, maintain your retention rate. And like, what are some of the ways that you incentivize it? Uh, or if you could share any challenges that you have faced in that, and how uh, how how do, what did you do to sort of overcome that? Yeah. My second question is um, um, from the uh, sort of like initiation to now. Now that you've grown a little bit, uh, much bigger than that you had expected, for example, like how, how, what's your operational uh, cost, for example, if you could share, or, or if you can't share that, like what's your company size right now? Like how many employees do you have right now? Well, I'm pretty open at the actually. Um, so, so to answer your question with regards to client retention, uh, that's something that we are still learning today. Uh, I'll be honest with you, when we first started, we were really bad at it. Uh, and part of the reason why could be that uh, we didn't explore enough or we didn't experiment enough in ways to do that. Uh, but right now, um, part of the things that are the strategies that we use for retention is always uh, relationship building, but not by the traditional way of setting up meetings, meeting up for coffee and relation, but basically cyber stalking the companies. Uh, so whenever they have something coming up, we know about it by the news or online and then we, uh, when we reach out to them, we actually have, for example, let's say Diram is launching a brand new promotion. Uh, when we reach out to them, we reach out with a picture of that ad, how it would look like on cars, the moment uh, we say hi. So they, they are throwing the idea to them. We do incentivize them. Uh, with like in Malaysia there are a ton of holidays, way more than the holidays. So for every single holiday, that's a reason for us to incentivize them to advertise for the holidays. Uh, but I, I will tell you, uh, in terms of innovation in that field, we are still working on it. Uh, right now, there's a lot of innovation that we are building internally in house to get a lot more clients. We haven't reached the. Uh, we haven't worked on a lot on retention side uh, innovation as much. But just to share with you on. Getting clients, uh, we did experiments on cold calling, cold emailing, uh, setting up meetings, uh, events, as well as LinkedIn marketing. And we did the same thing, but we did like uh, the success criteria. How many emails you sent out, how many replies did you get at? And everything has the same uh, goal, set up a presentation meeting. With the, so everything has the same goal. So we got data with regards to what works best, and what took the least amount of money slash effort. So we found our LinkedIn marketing works really well. So right now we have our tech team actually working on LinkedIn automation tools that are totally outside the MyBombs business model, but helps us guess more sales, right? Uh, so even before we got the tech team to work on that, we actually used existing tools out there on LinkedIn to automate it and test it out, see if it works. And we found out that uh, more than 10% of people we reach out to actually book a calendar slot for a presentation uh, using LinkedIn. So that's how we are trying to innovate the sales funnel. I'll let you know once we innovate the retention side. Uh, your second question was, yeah, how much was our burn rate, right, basically? Um, happy to say we are way leaner than any other company in the industry, and at least uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we currently have a team of 10. Uh, we have two uh, developers who are Maldivians as well. Uh, one of them is here right now. <laughs> uh, roughly around, yeah, 25 to 30 k per month. The bar rate. Yeah, uh, in ringgit. Uh, how much is that? 30 times four. Yeah, 120 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing that we are still proud of is when we do start our mentoring sections for the first whole year of our business, we spent less than 70k in ringgits to launch our website to get our first two big contracts uh, and register over 12,000 drivers. So the and there are, it's not that difficult to stay lean to be honest. Uh, yeah, I can share later about lean practices. Let's take a break for prayers.
into startups, but it's very difficult to, for us to convince since most of the, because there are so, so few startups in Maldives and most of them are leaving the country and going abroad to do their own startups. So what do you think is the challenge uh, that we have in our country? Why can't we do startups here? Um, I, I think uh, it comes with, for startups to succeed, there are a few ingredients, I would say. But I think it's, it is slowly showing up uh, in Maldives. Uh, I would say three years ago, we wouldn't even have imagined things like this happening in the Maldives, right? Uh, it's slowly coming into play. Uh, I think the main thing uh, that uh, investors, not investors, a mentor network is what startups need. A mentor, a network of mentors, whether it be from other different startups, like guys like Harris uh, or myself, um, or it could even be industry specialists, like uh, even though there are people from corporates, they can share a lot of great insights about how they've done marketing. And, you, and as a startup founder, you can decide what you want to absorb and reject. Right? Uh, but I think what Maldives lacks is first of all a reliable mentor network and uh, uh, basically the idea of when me and uh, my co-founder started, we actually had uh, monthly or bi-weekly coffee sessions with founders of other startup companies, right? And then we just were very open about problems that we were having. We would just say, oh, we had a meeting with this client, he was so annoying, you know? We'd just be very open about it, right? Uh, so I think those kind of community events, similar to Startup Grind, and even more informal events, where people are more open to share about, even if it's just ideas, right? Uh, let's say you have an idea you're interested to work on, but you don't know where to start. Just be open about it, and then things like that happen. Uh, secondly, uh, I do feel Maldives does require a bit of work in terms of investor education. Investors don't know what they're investing in uh, when it comes to investing in startups. Uh, so that also requires a bit of work, I would say, in the Maldives. How could we improve that? Is again more be, being more open. But there are actually uh, talks for investors in the Malaysia in Malaysia where uh, the idea is uh, basically this is what you need to look out for when you're investing in tech startups. This is how they are different from property investing or uh, traditional business investing. Things like that, right? So those kind of things, I do feel that Maldives is on the right track. It's just uh, I would say. Uh, Malaysia was in this stage back in 2014 uh, when startups were still in the infancy. So, give it another two, three years, I would see. I think we would see a lot more of that happening. Um, for the case of people leaving the country, uh, I think once things start falling into place, and we have people like Harris and more people volunteering, like Women in Tech as well, to turn this into a startup ecosystem. Uh, they'll come back, or we'll have new blood jumping in as well. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Did I say something funny? <laughs> we, we have someone who's built that, so he has something ironic. <laughs> who's also a partner of Spark and Bezos, so it's a bit funny. <laughs> so, any more questions? It's a good chance because he'll be flying off to Malaysia again and you can't find him on the streets, yeah. unlike us. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But if you come to Malaysia, I can let me know. Is that about it? Okay, so, yeah. Okay. So since we don't have any more questions from the audience, it's going to be, uh, we're going to wrap up for today. Okay. And once again, uh, thank you, thank you so much for coming in and joining us on Friday. Uh, we will have more events in the future uh, with Dira and Sparkle. We'll be organizing more startup events, and see you again. So, thank you so much.